What's up everybody, Will Borza here of Borza Mastering. It's the analog vlog. It's a vlog, analog. Okay, today I'm here in uh, Burbank's historic audio district. Warner Brother Records, Disney Records, Universal's like a mile away as the drone flies. Uh, Dolby is right here and uh, Cali Audio is here. This is their new HQ and I've been invited to check out their new Atmos room. I'm so excited, let's go find it. So I'm gonna be meeting with Charles, who's the director of acoustics for Kali Audio. He's the guy that's responsible for making these speakers sound so dang good. This is my buddy Nate here. What's up, dude? How you doing? What's going on, bud? Um, do you know where Charles is? Do I know where Charles is? Yeah. No. <laughs> let's go find him. Okay. Charles. It is time. It is time, okay. How you doing? What's up, man? Show me this Atmos room. Oh, okay. Atmos room. Atmos room. Where are we going so, with you? And now for something completely different. So we want to synchronize the audio? Yes, right. I do. Three, two, one. Perfect. <laughs> wow, that's a great sounding room. Yeah, it is. The way it? that clap just kind of... Well, it... Well, you're talking about the reverberation time. And uh, reverberation time is uh, in the acceptable range of 250 milliseconds to 500 milliseconds. Sorry to be propeller head. Within the acceptable range. It is. Look, you don't want a room with too much reverberation because it sounds echoing and, you know, the reverberation goes on too long. You also don't want a room that's too dead for a couple of reasons. Um, number one, it's lifeless. Number two, um, you're soaking up low frequency energy that you pay money for. Mm. So, more about that, dude. Later. I haven't even asked a question. <laughs> and yeah, no, like no, 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 no. A it's, wealth of information. Well, we're just talking about <laughs> clapping, and it's like, wow, it sounds right. But the, yeah, there's a reason why it's right. Totally, um, Charles. It's great to meet you. You nice are the you. director of acoustics ish, yes. ish for Cali Audio. Can you tell me about like what you do on a day to day basis? <laughs> Um, okay, I am responsible for the, not just acoustics, but systems design of our products. And that's basically how everything works together, um, working with our mechanical and electrical departments, working with marketing um, to help architect our products and set specifications and work with everybody to deliver a system. Uh, it's my system's responsibility. Okay. And then acoustics responsibility is getting the loudspeakers to perform at the maximum performance level for any price point. Well, you do your job incredibly well. Well, thank you. Um, I love my IN8V2s, which are surrounding us right now. Yes. And uh, I've been using them pretty much every day. No, definitely every day um, for, gosh, six months. Yeah, Nine they were a lot of fun to develop, and um, it was really a, a, a realization of something that, you know, I, I've been looking towards for a long time. Hearing them in Atmos set up <laughs> for, for the first time is like, like I've seen, um, I've been to the Atmos room at Capitol Records. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars setting it up. Other than that, my only experience with Atmos is like the simulated room that's happening in here. <sighs> Which AirPods. works for the majority of people, but not for everybody. Because yeah. these are based on head-related transfer functions that don't mimic the geometry of everybody's head. Right. Um, to right. get the Atmos to come together most reliably, you really got to be in an Atmos room. Yeah. But it's nice not to spend a hundred thousand dollars or more. Yeah. So um, knowing that um, you know, IN8 V2s are quite affordable. Yes. Um, this whole room is probably less than twenty k. Probably. Without respect to the rest of the signal chain, um, the IN8s uh -huh. are three ninety nine a piece. The IN5s that are over our heads are. 349 a piece. The subwoofers, front and back, this is two subwoofers, are 599 a piece. Mm -hmm. So, you know, much less than 10K. Wow. Okay. Much wow. less than 10K. Just for just for the loudspeakers. <laughs> and of course you've got acoustic treatments in the room. But as you can see, 
there's not an abundance of those, those treatments in this room, nor should there be. Okay, tell me more about that. Okay. Can we maybe just go piece by piece around the room and tell sure, me sure, what's, sure, what's sure. going on? Okay. Uh, we have the panels from Psy Acoustics uh, behind the front left and right, and the side surrounds uh, the speakers. Gick Acoustics behind the center um, channel and the rear surrounds. Mm-hmm. We have a custom-designed absorber above our heads. For the loudspeakers, we have uh, an absorber behind all the loudspeakers. Okay. Okay. Because the reflections from behind the loudspeaker is neutral to bad, so you want to pull those down. Um, you have one from above you because the uh, reflections from the ceiling don't add anything to your sound stage or totally. or your sense of uh, depth of a stereo image. The strategy was to put the minimum number of panels in and then to see where our reverberation time was. Uh, yeah. The reverberation time in this room without any treatment was over one and almost one and a half seconds with a big lump at 1K. Oh boy. When we started, mm-hmm. yeah, well, it's to be expected. Yeah. But when we put the acoustics treatments in the room, our reverberation time is about 350 milliseconds, which is between, in, in, it's in the range of between 250 milliseconds and 500 milliseconds, which is the target for immersive sound. In that, we were able to get the reverberation to a target range and also mitigate some of the, the nasty reflections in the room. You know, we optimized the dimensions as much as we could in the room, but we mm-hmm. still have three problematic modes, which we then deal with in EQ. But the nice thing okay. is because we're not pulling the bass, all of the bass down non-selectively, mm-hmm. we're pulling peaks down. If you use an abundance of absorption, what will happen is you'll pull your entire bass region down, and then you're having to fill in dips, and you're taking directly away from your dynamic range. Oh. Not a good idea. Well, you're also, you're spending a lot of money on a subwoofer, and then you're pulling it trying away. to get rid of the subwoofer. Yeah, but here's <laughs> the thing. You don't fix the motor response of the room by just adding non-selective bass traps. Uh-huh. You don't fix it. You just right. pull it down. Yeah. And yeah. now, rather than pulling down peaks, you're filling in dips. Not the right way to do it. Right. The right way to do it is deal with your reverberation time and then deal with remaining modes, you know, after you optimize your room dimensions, get your loudspeakers in the right place, deal with your room modes by surgical EQ of those modal peaks, or, okay. which is what we're going to be going to, mm-hmm. is uh, acoustic bass traps that are tuned to the specific problem frequencies that will pull them out. Is, is that something like a Helmholtz? It is a Helmholtz resonator. resonator? Um, and yep. Well, you can use Helmholtz resonators, you can use diaphragmatic absorbers, uh-huh. but it has to be tuned such that it notches out those particular frequencies. Got it. Because you can actually be in a situation, give me an example, if you have a, um, a room mode that has a null in your listening position, mm-hmm. and you attenuate that through the use of a tuned absorber, your level will actually come up. You're absorbing that frequency, but your level is going to come up at your listening position because you're attenuating that mode. Yeah, it's an acoustic <laughs> trick. That but scares me. That's the way it works. <laughs> the end result: get your room dimensions right, get your loudspeakers in the right place, mm-hmm. use a minimum number, of, minimum amount of absorption, cert, uh, strategically placed. Um, get your reverberation time right, but also get it neutral in frequency, which this room is. And then deal with your problem modes, either with EQ pulling those peaks mm-hmm. down or with tuned absor- base absorber to notch them out. So you're currently using EQ for this room? Currently we are. We, and what we, are you using for that? We are, our um, signal chain goes from an Apple TV to a Yamaha receiver. Great. From Yamaha receiver, we'll pull off the, um, the Atmos channels into balanced audio that goes into the uh, Matrix Studio. The Matrix Studio has the EQ and delays and and trims that we need. Got it. Uh, oh, by the way, the Yamaha, if I was doing a home room, mm-hmm. like a listening room for like watching movies and things, mm-hmm. I could completely get away with the Yamaha receiver that we have because it also has the ability to put the EQs in. But since we want to be able to use Pro Tools in this room, we sure. put it in this Matrix Studio. I know every Cali speaker has dip switches on the back where you can adjust boundaries and uh, a little bit of EQ. Yes. Are and you using any of that in this room? No. Okay. Nodding. Cool. No. And the, <laughs> there's, here's the reason. is because 
those switches are there for people who don't have the luxury of using totally. room tuning, mm-hmm. right? Yep. But if you're using room tuning and you're going to tune for, tune for the room, your tuning includes the boundary that the loudspeakers are in. So your end sure. result won't be any different whether you use the boundary switches or not because okay. you're going to be tuning based on the room. So we set everything to the standard anechoic tuning in the room, mm-hmm. then we're applying EQ to do room correction and boundary correction at the same time. I use Sonarworks because I don't have any other solutions for uh, you know measuring speakers in the room and yada yada. I, and, I uh, would advocate uh-huh. that um, even if you did not have Sonarworks, yeah. we have available the videos online to show people how to use a freeware piece of software called Room EQ Wizard. Cool. A standard calibrated microphone mm-hmm. to be able to measure the room if if only for the purpose of putting your loudspeakers in the right place. Yeah. But then if you have EQ available to be able to get a room tuning that makes sense. And we use a moving microphone method. Um, that a, a highly esteemed colleague was uh, nice enough to show me when I was working at uh, a previous company. Like with Sonarworks, you place it, it measures, you place it, it measures, you place it, it measures. So yeah, it gets 36 moving, measurements. A moving microphone, like you're literally moving the microphone around. You're literally swinging around right? like Roger Daltrey. That sounds like way more fun. It is more fun. It is absolutely <laughs> more fun. You can this way, you can move this way, you can move it figure eight. <laughs> But the cool part about it is, is mm. however you move that microphone, yeah. you always get the same answer. Okay, yeah, that's okay. important. So, look, this is a tangent, but I'm going to completely go off on this tangent. I'm ready. If you can take three measurements mm-hmm. and get three different results, which one are you going to trust? Which I've done with Sonarworks. I, I'm not going to make any comments about You didn't say that, I said that. I'm not going to make any comments about anybody's system, but if you can make, take three different measurements and get yeah. three different results, mm-hmm. which one do you trust? Uh, none of them. I did an experiment and uh, have the data to show where I went to three different studios and I put up 216 microphone positions. Same microphone moving around. Okay. 216. So I, a couple of foundational assumptions. Number one, an infinite number of microphone positions is what the, what the actual spatial average is. Foundational assumption number two, an absurd number of microphone positions is close enough to an infinite number <laughs> of microphone okay, positions. Yeah. Got okay, yeah. So I follow. <laughs> I'm going to say that 216 microphone positions Plenty. is absurd. Yeah. Okay, so we did that in three different studios. Mm-hmm. And then we did the moving microphone method. And we got the same results. Wow. When you randomly select numbers of positions from the 216 microphones, the moving microphone method correlates to 36 microphone positions in the same space. It gives you the same answer. And you take measurement three different times, you get the same results. Mm -hmm. So the measurement is solid. You can use it. You can trust it. You can make decisions based on it. REW is a freeware program, mm-hmm. but it is um, freeware by donation that to facilitate the further development of the software, donations are encouraged. And we encourage people cool. to, to support the software because it's Absolutely. really, really good software. Um, and it gives you good results and it allows you to do things um, which is completely out, out of the scope for our conversation as far as room tuning, as far as room mode predictions, as mm-hmm. far as you know, looking at your waterfall plots, looking your, at your reverberation time, you can do all of those measurements in that software. Wow. Really awesome. Good software. Yeah. You get good measurements. Now you can apply those EQ if you have a, a, a matrix, matrix studio. Mm-hmm. Well, you can put all that EQ directly in that system and you get a good result. Incredible. This is what we heard in this room. Get the best microphone you can. Get a decent microphone. Get a five dollar ca- microphone. Well, you can do it with a five dollar microphone <laughs> for the purpose of getting your loudspeakers in the right place. Yeah, but I wouldn't necessarily make EQ decisions based on a five dollar microphone. Microphone. Sure. What you mm-hmm. want is a microphone that has a calibration file that is individual to the microphone, mm-hmm. so that you know that the measurements you're taking have a calibrated SPL result. 
Got it. Right? Okay. If you need to know what your level is, set it, say you're setting up a room like this, you want to have a microphone calibrator so you can calibrate the SPL level of the microphone. Mm -hmm. Now it's not just a measurement for our frequency response, it's also an SPL meter, which you can then use to set level for a system like this. Um, those microphones are on the order of 50 to a hundred dollars. Oh, it's not bad. It's not bad at all. Yeah. No. They probably don't like sound like an exciting microphone that you'd want to necessarily record a guitar or a vocal through. But no. <laughs> yeah, no, they're just no, very but, flat, right? No, it's a, it's a flat <laughs> response microphone. Yeah. It's a calibrated response, yeah. which will absolutely be unexciting, but right. you would use a microphone to record with as part of the artistic process mm -hmm. to add a certain sound to what you're recording. Yep. That's not what we're talking about. Right. We're talking about taking an yeah, analytical measurement accurate. of this is what this level is yep. and back up a step. Sure. My job, mm -hmm. if I could summarize it in a phrase, which has been used before, it's not my phrase, but I fully subscribe to it. My job is science in the service of art. And if I can keep myself focused on being, uh, of using science to the service of the people who are creating content, then I do my best work. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the microphones that I'm going to use are not going to be something you would use to create content or to make something that sound exciting. They're going to be uh, analytical instruments for me to be able to do my job, to set a foundation for people to be able to create content and make, make art. Yes. I love that. It's um, what I do. <laughs> Hello. Yeah, it still sounds good. Yeah, it does that. Um, I was I was uh, really happy with the way it turned out, especially since it's my first room that I I put together. Yeah, um, and actually. Math works. It does. Imagine it that. does. It absolutely does. <laughs> it's not like uh, it's not the sexy side of making music, but man, if you skip it, what are you even the doing? The cool part about it is, it can be as propeller head as you want it to be. It can be as unsexy as it is. Mm -hmm. Yet at the same time, when you get it to work correctly, technology sufficiently advanced is magic. Yeah. yeah, and and yeah. it can be effectively magic, totally. But it's not magic; it's just science. Next question. Yeah, there's no carpet. That's not a question. Mm. That's a true statement. Um, <laughs> it's less important because we have point source loudspeakers. We are eventually going to put a carpet in here. I know I've talked about this in other videos, but yeah. it's because you brought it up, and I think it's worth talking about the point source property of Cali speakers. Can I talk about that for a second? Absolutely. It's really cool. Uh, go on. Hey, it won't be a second. It'll be a few minutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So Cali loudspeakers have um, the ION8 and the ION5s are a three-way loudspeaker. It looks like a two-way, but it's actually a three-way. It's got a woofer. It's got a mid-range. It's got a tweeter. Tweeter and a mid-range, coaxial, and coincident. Mm -hmm. Not just coaxial. Coaxial means they share the same axis, but coincident from the standpoint the tweeter is sitting at the base of the mid-range cone. And that means that they have better time alignment. Uh, the mid-range cone is acting as a waveguide for good directivity control. Um, and um, we have a woofer that goes up to about 300 cycles here. So to limit the mid-range uh, excursions so you don't have the intermodulation distortion you would if you were using a, a coax coaxial or coincident where it's trying to do full range in that unit. Um, the wavelength, I'm sorry, 300 hertz between the mid-range and the woofer, this is less than a quarter wavelength, so effectively this is a point source. It's the reason why the the overheads don't have to be aimed at you. Now, yeah, they're straight down, they're not pointed in. Dolby spec says that you got to point the loudspeakers at at the listener. Sure. Right? Uh -huh. Well, the reason why they say that is number one, <laughs> many loudspeakers don't have good directivity, so the horizontal, you know, the the timbre of the off axis horizontal doesn't match the on axis. Mm -hmm. And then they could be a two way loudspeaker. So at the crossover frequency there's an interference, it's an acoustic interference between the two drivers that are making the same frequency. It will just 
have a, a giant lobe of energy in the center and then notches above and below. Uh, yeah. So mm -hmm. in order to have that flat response, and by the way, this is the reason why a lot of places will have so much absorption, is they're trying to pull off the off-axis energy of a loudspeaker that doesn't match the timbre of the direct sound. Let's say you have a two-way loudspeaker. Yeah. And let's say that that tweeter is sitting on the baffle without a waveguide. Okay, so the woofer goes up to, let's say, two kilohertz. Okay. Okay, up at the uh, top end of the woofer's range, mm -hmm. the, the radiation pattern starts to pull in. It starts to, to focus and beam, turn into a flash. More light. directive. It's yeah. more mm -hmm. directional. Mm -hmm. and then the tweeter turns on at two kilohertz, and it's wide open because it's only an inch diameter. Yeah. Okay, so you can make that flat. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. People disdain. <laughs> flat loudspeakers because they don't have a, an interesting mid-range. Well, one of the right. reasons is, is because you get it flat on axis, uh -huh. when you move off axis, there's a giant hole in the mid-range because the woofer, yep. Yep. as you move off axis, the woofer is pulling down the frequency mm -hmm. and then the tweeter turns on, you have this lump of energy. So in here, there's this giant suck out in the mid-range. Yeah, I get it. For a flat loudspeaker. Uh -huh. Okay, a proper loudspeaker the direct and indirect sound has the same timbre, okay, for a lot of different reasons. Go into those reasons, but a properly engineered two-way loudspeaker, such as our LP6 or LP8, mm -hmm. is a two-way loudspeaker with directivity control to keep that continuity between the off-axis or the, the total sound power timbre and the direct sound. Okay. That's as much as we can do with a two-way, but you still have the interference between the drivers at the crossover frequency. Yeah. You still have to, even though you can move them, you have more flexibility in the in the horizontal plane of the loudspeaker, you still have that thing going on in the vertical, right? Mm -hmm. Where you have mm -hmm. a notch, you have a, you have a suck out above and below the design plane, just because of the interference of the two drivers. Sure. One's going up, one's going down. Yeah, yeah makes sense. So this overcomes that because they don't have an interference. Mid range and the and the tweeter is coaxial, so there's no interference. All the ones and then the mid range, the woofer is within mm -hmm. a quarter wavelength, so there's no notch there either. Wow. So you've got an acoustic point source. It's the reason why these don't have to be pointed in is because the timbre is a point source. Dude, that's incredible. That's <laughs> the way it's supposed to be. That's the way it's supposed to be. That's the way it's supposed to be. You, you did it right. Well, that's great. Yeah, I don't know if anybody can see the. Um, QRD panels that we have in the location of our first lateral reflection for the left and right speakers. Mm -hmm. Those basically take the first lateral reflections of the left and right mains and they break them up so they don't comb with the with the mains. Right. But the reason why they're there is because the off-axis timbre is the same as the direct sound and so the first lateral reflections enhance the stereo sound stage. Right? Okay, yeah. It's not, it's yeah. not magic, it's mm -hmm. just science. The timbre matches, your your brain integrates those sources into a single perception of space. Okay, so it'll make the speakers feel wider, make the sound stage feel bigger wider. and wider than it is. Bigger and wider, more enveloping. Awesome. Look, if you're doing immersive sound, you've got to start with a loudspeaker that has good spatial resolution. Yeah. Okay, I've heard it been yeah. said that you can... You can get your head wrapped around any monitor and make your mixes translate. Mm -hmm. And that's true with regards to timbre mm -hmm. only, but it's not true with regards to spatial resolution. Mm -hmm. If your loudspeakers don't have good directivity control, you lose spatial resolution and you cannot get it back by getting used to the way they sound because every location you go into is going to be different. Whether or not you're using a two-way or a three-way with coaxial, you have to have good loudspeakers with you have to have loudspeakers with good directivity. Right. Good or directivity. else you're you're compromising your ability you're compromising your ability to hear what's in the mix. Yeah, because it's not about uh, it's not just about low and high. It's not just about yeah, it's not twenty hertz to twenty K. It's the purpose of a studio Stand monitor space. is not to sound beautiful. That, that's not the reason why it exists. Mm -hmm. The purpose of a studio monitor is to be a tool for somebody who's creating content to understand what's in their mix to be able to make the right decisions. Yeah. Those right decisions have to do with EQ, 
have to do with you know where things sit in the mix mm -hmm. and also with regards to how the, the the sound stage or how the spatial resolution of the mix sits yeah yeah and then you want them to be unbiased you want them to be That's right. just true yeah I, yeah yeah and now I would submit that I prefer to listen to a neutral loudspeaker mm -hmm. just for listening. Mm -hmm. um, maybe that's the case for everybody. Everybody, maybe it's not, but I will strongly um, advocate for the idea that for content creation, you need to have a neutral reference. Oh, certainly. With good directivity. Certainly. I'm noticing two subwoofers in here. Yes. Not in the corners, not in the center. And they're diagonal of each other. Yes. Okay, and they're only there's only one channel of LFE. Yes. The reason why I'm using those, um, now I am going to reposition them, um, but I am using them. They sounded good, as it yeah, was. No, they are, <laughs> they are. Um, but there's decisions that you need to make. But the reason that they're in opposite corners is because they're canceling some of the room modes. Remember I said there's three mm -hmm. room modes left? Well, one of the tricks that I use to get rid of some of the mirror modes is to put the loudspeakers, the subwoofers in location that doesn't excite the modes, yeah. or it cancels the modes. So the the subwoofers are in the quarter points of the room. They're 25% in from this wall, 25% in from this wall and back in mm -hmm. opposite corners. Mm -hmm. So that by being you know a quarter of the way into the, the room, there are room modes that they do not excite and by being in opposite corners of the room, there are room modes that they cancel. I'm going to evaluate placing those um, in the quarter points of the room on opposite sides of the room this way, uh -huh. um, okay. simply because uh, when you're getting the room tuned and you're time aligning everything, keep in mind that the listening position of for Atmos is two thirds of the way back from the front of the room. Mm -hmm. Well, those two loudspeakers the two subwoofers cannot be um, time aligned with one another with regards to the listening position. Mm. Does it make a difference to me as I'm hearing it? No. However, the compulsive side of my brain is going, you know, it would be, I want to be able to, to experiment, and we encourage people to experiment, putting them in other positions that work for the, for the room modes. Yeah. Um, but if I put them in, as an example, the quarter points of the room this way, opposite each other, then they'll still also not excite room modes and they'll also cancel room modes. Um, there might be one room mode that they allow to get worse, mm -hmm. um, but I will be able to time align them at the listening position. Gotcha. So different considerations. Mm -hmm. Where they're at is great. Um, we have two subwoofers, not because we need the bass, but it's because we're doing things with the room acoustics to... Yeah, they, they're helping. They're sort of supporting each other. Yes, Got and it. they're they're canceling room problems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very cool. Yeah. Awesome. Good positioning and yeah, kind of brilliant. <sighs> I, I, I wish it was my idea, but I'm just, you know, uh, following the good advice of uh, esteemed colleagues. Okay, let's say I am starting out. Mm -hmm. I just bought a great new set of Cali IN8 V2s because they sound amazing and yep. everybody recommends them. Right. What else do I get with those Calis to optimize the room acoustically? If I have a pretty little budget and I can't necessarily put all this acu acoustic treatment, but okay. I want to make sure we're doing stuff right. What are What's step one, two, and three? What can I set up? We do an Atmos. We do a stereo pair. Oh, no, gonna... I, I'm not made of money. A stereo pair. Yeah. Brilliant. <laughs> All right. M Box so, or Scarlet or something. You know. Great. Okay. So I got a stereo pair of um, of Ion Eights. Yeah. And I don't have a lot of money to spend. Exactly. Okay. Well, I can fortunately afford free. Free is good. Free is good. I like free. Free is awesome. Yeah. I would be using REW. Okay. And yeah. maybe the five dollar microphone solution. Sure. Or if I could get, uh, and I think I bought a calibrated uh, Dayton audio microphone for like thirty or forty dollars. It was scandalously cheap. Cool. Even if I don't have a calibrated SPL level, mm -hmm. if I've got a calibrated mic to wave around, 
I've already got an audio interface. Now I can use that audio interface with with a microphone that's calibrated. Really strong suggestion to do that to mm -hmm. to be able to put a lot of those pictures where I think I want to be at. Measure them. See how crazy the response is. Use the boundary compensation. See how the response sits. Put them in a second location. Measure that. Put them in a third location. Measure that. Which location has the most even base? Okay. This is without it's finding any EQ, you know, or yeah. potentially, um, I think there's a way to use your DAW mm -hmm. to put a little bit of EQ in. If you can do that and you can measure with a calibrated microphone, well, now we can really optimize the response of the speakers. Mm, yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, as far as what I would do with the room, um, yeah, you want to have an abundance of furniture to soak up the sound so your your reverberation time is you know, reasonable. Um, so go around like when college is let out and find a couch on the side of the street. Exactly. It you know, if you want, it's like the guy who finds <laughs> the pizza on the side of the road. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's not. It's an audio engineer. He's just looking for a mattress to shove in the back of his <laughs> Right? You can achieve a lot of the same results just by putting a lot, of, again, put your absorption behind your loudspeakers. Mm -hmm. Right? Yep. Don't worry about the corners. Deal with the corners separately. If you got room in your DAW to, to put a couple bands of EQ, don't worry about don't worry about bass traps. You can deal with it with EQ. Cool. Better to pull it down mm -hmm. than put it back in. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Um, I use Reaper, and Reaper has a monitor effects channel that's completely separate from your master bus, so you can load in EQs and stuff like that, and they will never touch the sound. You forget about them. You forget to turn them off. You hit bounce. It's okay because they're in a completely different path. Good. Yeah. Good. And, Super and again, it should be as convenient as possible for mm -hmm. people to make the adjustments to their system. Um, a loudspeaker, as much as I try, as much as I can do with a loudspeaker, below about 700 hertz, it's absolutely your room yeah. and where the loudspeakers are. Yeah. Okay. The best that we can do, from our perspective, is to equip you to be able to measure get them in the right place mm -hmm. and deal with the room as much as you can to get that neutral sound. I, you may hear me emphasizing that repeatedly. Got it. It's not that I'm forgetting that I'm saying it. It's that is, <laughs> that's the important. most important thing. It is like hugely important to get the loudspeakers in the right place yeah. and get them to work with your room. There you go. Because you got to make your mix translate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And a neutral monitor can only be a neutral monitor when the, the, the loudspeakers in the room are working as a system correctly. Got it. Okay, so monitors, REW, yeah. $30 microphone that measures the room-ish. With a calibrated response. you got to get a microphone needs a calibration. Needs a calibrated so. response. Yeah. And um, at least a little bit of... Uh, treatment absorption behind the monitors. Sure. If you're going to put absorption, put it behind the, the monitors. Yeah. Uh, your first lateral reflections for stereo repair. If you've got monitors with good directivity, mm -hmm. like Callies, like Callies, you don't want to absorb that. You want to use something that will break that up, okay. and you can get inexpensive QRD from. Uh, I think Toman is where we got these. Mm -hmm. um, or even if you put bookshelves in. Yeah, you bookshelves. Put a Home Depot, get some two by fours and chop them up. I get to give you the clap three times. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah, I'm. I <laughs> I have a. I'm. I'm part of an audio group that um, has rather than applauding. When people do presentations, <clears throat> they do a single clap, and so we call it the clap. <laughs> Perfect. So go there and get the clap. Because <laughs> we're audio guys. Well, on that note. <laughs> on that note. <laughs> um, it is wonderful being here. I feel like I've learned way too much for the half hour that it's been. Um, you are definitely coming over and helping me build my next studio. <laughs> okay. Uh, that's gonna be a thing and, and just thank you so much it was thank great you. to meet you it was great to talk about this stuff and it's awesome to get to nerd out 
Uh, yeah, Sometimes. that's kind of my specialty. I like to geek out. <laughs> For the best. Yeah. Um, can I listen to some more, some, some more yeah, stuff? Yeah, absolutely. Out here? Sweet. Let's do it. All right. Wow, so that was like a crazy amount of information thrown at me really fast. And like, I'd be lying if I said I caught all of it, but I'm super stoked to review this footage and maybe uh, sit down with a notepad and take notes because uh, I, I learned a ton. And, uh, reviewing that footage i'm sure i'll learn a lot more i hope you guys learn a lot more and uh yeah see you guys in the next one peace